once again, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to assemble together and uh, fellowship with the word of God. And today, of course, as it is customary in our fellowship, on every second Sunday, we gather to also have communion. How I miss uh, the times when we could all sit and eat together and uh, also have communion. Hopefully that day is not far away. But every time we come together to take communion, we always try to do it with a sense of purpose. We, un we try to understand what it means for us and what it reminds us of. Because every time we are able to find meaning in the communion and in any of our Christian activities and practices, it provides us with a sense of hope. Uh, especially now we live in difficult circumstances. We need a sense of direction in life. And it's always important for us to find that direction in uh, the scriptures, in, of course, our triune God. And so today, hopefully, I will lead you into bringing and participating in the communion from uh, hopefully a sense of uh, not only a meaning, but also a sense of tremendous purpose with why, as, as to why we do it. Um, give me just a moment as I go ahead and share my screen with you. Uh, I have titled my sermon as uh, The Greatest Miracle. And hopefully as uh, uh, we go along with the sermon, we will be able to see why I have brought this title uh, you know, to the sermon today. Let's look at the text once again that was read to us by Nelson. And we go to John chapter 6. We know the story. This is a very familiar story for us, an event that takes place in the life and ministry of Jesus. This is also something that Sunday school, in, in Sunday school, we, you know, teach children on uh, how Jesus performs this very powerful miracle. But I'd like you to notice the, uh, especially those uh, wordings that I have uh, given a red color to. Uh, and it seems like a very strange question, isn't it? In verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? It seems like a, a, a strange question because why ask the question when he knows what he's going to do? Right? Uh, why should Jesus even try to attempt to ask a question like that? But it's very interesting through this short conversation, we can learn a lot and uh, I'm hoping that we can glean some information from this very interesting but short conversation that Jesus has with Philip. And so I'm not going to go into the rest of the story because that is something that we have studied many a times. But uh, how can we bring this learning from these, uh, this question that Jesus asks into our practice of living a Christian life. And of course, of today, especially partaking in the communion. All right, so let me just break it down into three parts. And the first one, let's consider this particular question where Jesus asks, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And obviously, uh, when you look at that question and when you look, of course, Jesus had multiple motives when he asked that question. But one thing should be very obvious. And what is obvious is that Jesus knows our needs, right? He recognizes that people would be hungry. He recognizes that people need to, uh, you know, be sustained by physical food. 
And not only does he recognize our needs, he's concerned for them. He's concerned over the needs that we have in our daily lives. So if we recognize that Jesus is concerned for us and our needs, it should encourage us to bring our needs to him, isn't it? Uh, we are we recognize that Jesus is very much concerned for all that we uh, all that we have in terms of needs, and that should give us the encouragement to come to him and that and that is one of the reasons why we have intercession with a sense of confidence. We have an inter, uh, you know an intercessory prayer session every Sunday because we believe that Jesus is concerned for our needs. We believe that he encourages us to come and cry out to him, right, uh, over the needs that we have. In one sense, we are acknowledging our helplessness when we recognize that some needs cannot be just fulfilled by human uh, attempt or by human, uh, you know, strength. It needs intervention. It needs a person like Jesus uh, to be able to fulfill those needs for us. Many a times, you know, in a, in, a, in a secular world that we live or a world where secularism is so very much emphasized, our egos tend to think that we can solve all our problems. And that was where humanism comes in. Humanism is a branch of philosophy and psychology that believes that we can do it all. We don't need anybody. And in fact, that is nothing more but the age old problem of human beings beginning from the Garden of Eden. When we think we don't need God, we think that we can sort out and solve our problems for ourselves, right? We think man is supreme, but Perhaps let us take a moment to recognize, to remember that indeed we are not supreme. Indeed, there are needs that we cannot fulfill by our own strength. We need the intervention of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we come to him in prayer. We come to him interceding. And of course, uh, how he will answer, how he will fulfill that need is his prerogative. It is Jesus who knows what is best and how he answers our petitions and our, our requests for intervention is something that we have to leave to himself. In uh, the, uh, the apostle Peter reminds us once again that we worship a God who cares for us. Notice in, the, in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 5, he says in verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. And in verse seven, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This is what the apostles want us to believe. Believe that he cares for us and we can come to him with all confidence and cast our anxieties upon him. And that needs humility. That's why in verse six, it says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God because he can lift you up. It needs humility for us to, to acknowledge that we are helpless. So that is one perspective we can glean from this conversation, the first part of that conversation. Let's go to the second part of the conversation. Jesus, uh, I mean, the, uh, the author John here uh, writes that uh, he asked this only to test him. Now, the way it is uh, written, it may seem a little daunting that Jesus was testing him. And we might wonder, oh my, am, am I going to go through various tests? Let's not forget, maybe, you know, to understand it in a better perspective. Let's not forget that Jesus was a great teacher, right? He was a rabbi. I mean, uh, or rather people called him rabbi who were considered to be Jewish religious teachers. So Jesus Christ comes from a teaching perspective, all right? So that is one thing which we need to keep in mind. And so he wanted to teach Philip and his disciples as to 
you know, what they needed to learn as his disciples, as they lived their lives uh, to then carry on to take the Gospels. Like Selena was telling us, the Gospels will go to the ends of the earth. They needed to learn. So his, the, the, uh, his motive in testing them is not just to give them pass marks or fail marks, but to teach them, to instruct them, to lift up their, uh, increase their understanding about him. And, but there is another very important reason. When John says he asked this, you know, he asked this only to test him, we also recognize that Jesus want to reveal himself to them. Right? He wants, uh, he wants us to know who he is. The fact that he is one come from God. And obviously that's one of the reasons why a miracle takes place. A little later down, if you read through the passage, you know the 5,000 being fed, 5,000 plus. And so he is also revealing himself through this conversation and the, uh, and the event that takes place to follow. All right. And what is the reason for all of this? Yes, it is to teach them. It is to reveal himself to them. And finally, he wanted them to grow in faith. He wanted to help their faith to grow. Jesus is concerned for our faith. He's not just concerned for bread. He's not just concerned in giving us bread. He's just not concerned only to perform a miracle to titillate our senses. But he wants our faith to grow. And that's the reason why on many occasions he had to chide the disciples in talking, talking to them and telling them that you have little faith. At one time he says, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed. And of course, you know, that you can move mountains. All of these opportunities Jesus takes so that he can help them grow in faith. And the faith as to who Jesus is. And that is where we are slowly coming into the conversation. Right? The conversation is slowly going into now helping us see who this Jesus Christ really is. You see, because Jesus slowly but surely reveals his divinity to them. That he was indeed one sent from God. And like we uh, studied last time that he was fully God and fully human, that he had come in the incarnation to increase our faith and, of course, to bring uh, salvation to us. So let's look at the progression of this conversation. We will go to the third part of the conversation now, where he says, where J the apost uh, Apostle John says, for well, he already had in mind what he was going to do. Right? Interesting, Jesus knew what he was going to do at that particular moment and from then on what he would be doing to uh, unfold his very purpose of having come to the earth, right? Now, one thing that comes to mind, obviously, is the fact that God knows we are unable to solve our problems, right? He asked that question to, the, to Philip. And you remember what Philip answers. He says it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Philip is saying this is impossible, God. This is just not, we just can't feed so many people. And so uh, God recognizes that. God understands that, that we cannot solve certain problems of our, you know, that we, we struggle with. Um, it's too big. It's too big for human power to solve certain problems, right? And in one sense, he, uh, uh, you know, the Apostle John is also speaking to our humanity. He's helping us recognize that there are things that we can't do, that we need help, that we need some kind of intervention, right? And so, if this is how Jesus knows that we can't solve our problem, then what is the answer? What is the answer? 
all right? And the answer, you know, as we see the story unfold, the answer is a miracle. You see, the, some problems cannot be sorted out unless it is a miracle, a special intervention by God, right? Uh, and it's interesting that there are some who recognized that even in the scriptures, the Mary, the mother of Jesus, early in her, early in the ministry of Jesus, recognized who this Jesus was. Of course, she had more reasons to understand who Jesus was, but she knew. And you remember in that event when the in the wedding uh, celebration, the uh, the wine ran out, and immediately mother of the mother of Jesus immediately said, "Go listen to him," because she knew what he could do. So, do we recognize sometimes it requires a miracle to sort out certain problems, right? Uh, now, there is something very interesting about this miracle. Let us just pro uh, proceed. A miracle is performed not for its sake, not just for its sake, perhaps I should say. A miracle is more than just, you know, a miracle. Jesus wants us to know that a miracle points to a reality beyond the miracle, right? A miracle is just doesn't stop there as a sign, but that sign points to something. And for those of you who have been attending the Gary Dero classes, uh, this is something we learned that uh, the signs and wonders that we see in the scriptures is not uh, an end in itself, but it points to something more important. So when Jesus says, he, has, he knows what he's going to do and he was going to perform a miracle. What was that sign? What was that miracle pointing to? That miracle was pointing to Jesus. The reality that a sign like a miracle points to is Jesus. In other words, this miracle of feeding the 5,000 points to the miracle himself, Jesus Christ our Lord. See, he is the miracle, finally. Ultimately, Jesus is the miracle, right? Uh, and it is in this miracle and the miracle that he performs as he gives his life to the world, right? Notice we are discussing what John writes, for he had already in mind what he was going to do. Jesus was going to also give himself to the world. And that is a miracle, right? Uh, he performs the most impossible feat of all, defeat sin and death. So a great miracle indeed, but by the greatest of miracles, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the son of God, right? So this miracle points to the greatest miracle. And you might remember my, uh, the title of my sermon, The Greatest Miracle. And that is something very important for us to learn. So having come this far, let's look at some points that we can apply in our, you know, in our Christian lives. First thing we keep in mind is never forget that Jesus cares for us. And we can be encouraged to bring our needs to him, right? Jesus indeed is the great, wonderful counselor, like we are told in the Old Testament scriptures. We can talk to him. We can cry out to him because he cares for us. That is something we should never, ever doubt. We might not understand how he responds or answers our, our requests, but never doubt that he cares for us. Secondly, he wants our faith to increase. And so we can confidently submit ourselves to the tests, so-called tests or teachings of Jesus so that we can grow in our faith. He wants our faith to grow because that helps us in a more intimate and a stronger relationship with him, right? 
it helps us to build a more secure relationship in with Jesus Christ our Lord and with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so that faith, the growth of that faith is very essential so that it feeds and strengthens our relationship with him. And finally, a third application, continue to believe in miracles, right? Continue to believe in miracles. Even as Jesus recognizes that it requires a miracle to feed 5,000, he knows that we need miracles in our own lives to sort out certain problems. And as I was just reflecting on the prayers today, uh, we need a miracle in our fellowship as we struggle with uh, a very difficult circumstance and an issue. It requires the miracle of changed minds. It requires the miracle of humble hearts. We cannot do it with our own strength. We cannot accomplish that with our own feeble you know, resources. It, is, it requires the intervention of Jesus. So I continue to believe in that miracle. I don't know how God will sort this out, but I am going to him and asking him to perform a miracle. And so you might have things that require miracles. Expect it. Pray for it. Believe in it. Because God continues to perform miracles today. But as you do, as you do expect miracles, come to the greatest miracle of all, Jesus Christ our Lord. As you expect miracles, don't stop with those miracles. Let it bring you closer to the greatest miracle, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? Uh, so, brethren, as uh, you continue to believe in the miracles of healing and the miracles of protection, the miracles of intervention. Let all of those signs, let, let all of those miracles be signs pointing to the greatest miracle of all, Jesus the Christ. Let it lead you to him who is indeed the answer to all the unsolvable problems of this world. Give your problems so that Jesus Christ can take care of them. And I hope that brings us now to the communion. What is the communion? The communion for me, from this perspective, is it celebrates the greatest miracle, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? And so, brethren, as we gather together, uh, let me just remind us that every time you take the communion, you are not only believing in miracles, you are believing in the greatest miracle of all, the person of Jesus Christ. And so come, come to the most precious, the best, the greatest miracle of all, Jesus the Christ. For he meets every one of your needs. For he is the one who will take care of more than just your needs. He is the one who can take us beyond sin and death. He is the one who can take us beyond physical life to eternal life. He is the one who can give us the communion with his father. He is the one who can give us the communion with the Holy Spirit. He is the one who can give us the communion with his glorified humanity. If you have your elements, you may bring them together at this time. And as I pray, after that, we will partake in the communion together. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we pause for a moment to reflect upon what you have helped us understand through your scriptures, we remember, Lord, yes, there are many miracles that takes place. We know that you protect us and you heal us, you provide for us, you intervene for us. But let every one of those just be signs to point us to the greatest miracle of all. And that is you, Lord Jesus Christ. It is you who 
is the greatest indeed miracle. Help us to grow in faith in you, even as we partake of this bread and wine, symbolizing the body that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us. We pray that you will bring your blessings upon it and upon our partaking, that you will give us greater faith to continue to believe in miracles. But as we believe and experience those miracles, help us, Lord, to come to the greatest miracle of all. And that is you yourself, Jesus Christ. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Let us take the bread. The body of Jesus Christ broken for us. Let us partake believing that Christ has redeemed us through his sacrifice. Let us take the wine, Christ's blood shed for us, indeed giving us communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us. 